this momentarily, so uh, please get yourselves ready. All right, we're going to start in two minutes. Find your friends, call your neighbors, get your family members in this room right now because we're about to light it up. Okay, two minutes. If there are folks hanging outside the door, tell them they're about to miss the event of their lives. We're going to have handheld mics. Handheld mics. 
and you can just pass it off to the next person. Um, oh, it's every other mic. I got it. I thought this through. <laughs> Well, hello. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah. 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 All right, before I tell you who I am, I just want to tell you that this front row is filled with people full of so much energy. This place is about to explode. Uh, my name is Sam Dyson, and I am privileged to stand here before you. Uh, it has been an honor to be part of the or organizing committee for the summit, uh, and an honor to introduce this fine group of 13 Ignite speakers, uh, and also an honor to um, represent the organization, the Chicago Learning Exchange, which is one of the sponsors for today's event. Uh, it <laughs> It happens also to be the first day that the Chicago Learning Exchange exists as an independent nonprofit that employs me and, and the great team of people I get to work with. So it's our Independence Day. Maria, our, our uh, executive director, rock on. Um, so uh, you guys know the deal of Ignite Talks. 20 slides, time to advance once every 15 seconds mercilessly, <laughs> regardless of stumbles and fumbles, the show goes on. The intent of these Ignite Talks is to not ignite this place physically, of course, but to ignite this place conceptually, with energy, with ideas, with humor, wit, charm. And these folks will come to the stage one after another, once their slides end and you give them some love, which we'll practice in a moment, uh, the next slides begin. 15 seconds for that transition. Now, of course, if you should be delayed by having to clean up the roses and dollar bills that have been thrown on the stage at you, those auto advanced slides will be stopped in between so that you can gather your goods uh, and find your seat. Uh, but we really, um, we trust that these folks are bringing some fuel for this ignition experience. We need you to bring a spark, all right? Uh, so I want to ask you to practice letting these people know that you're here with them in the room. I'm going to ask you to practice three ways of using your hands to let people know that you are bringing energy to help fuel uh, their effort. The first way, I like that too, I'll add a fourth. Let's just start here, just, just, get, just get yourself, oh yeah, that's nice. All right, uh, second, I'd like you to try your most exuberant and boisterous golf course clap. <laughs> nice, so tasteful. <laughs> Uh, thirdly, I'd like you to try a really synchronized and powerful single clap. I'm going to count to three. <laughs> right, okay. Simmer down. I'm going to count to three. Please don't be the student who doesn't listen and accidentally clap on three. This is one, two, three, clap, kadoom. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. And finally, let's just give a good old traditional boisterous clap that anyone from any planet would understand as meaning we love you and we're with you. One, two, three. Woo! is happening. Woo! All right. <laughs> Waiting. This is like bonus time in the beginning. So I'm going to set the bar really low. That's what I promised everybody. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk today about Global Game Jam Next, which is a collaboration. It's not a competition. Uh, it's actually just took place in the month of July. And um, it is an extension of the Global Game Jam team, uh, which was headed by uh, Susan Gold, Ian Schreiber, plus many others. Uh, the origin story actually was at DML for myself and Kevin Miklosh, uh, to, um, by Michael John here, who uh, brought us into the fold, into the Global Game Jam Next community, which is in its first year. So why do we do this? Why do we do this to ourselves? Um, it's because we want uh, not for kids to learn coding, but to be able to uh, learn systems as a way of thinking. Uh, coding is self-expression. Uh, not learning coding by uh, just um, programming or puzzles, or like crosser puzzles, as Mitch Resnick says, as a way to learn how to uh, read, but also by making and creating. So we created this portfolio, this um, curriculum of multiple pathways and interest-driven ways into creating games and game-like experiences. So we have all these different skills in our curriculum, and uh, it's really uh, part of the four C's of 21st century skills, which is critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Not just coding for the sake of coding, but coding as self-expression or creative coding. Uh, at all of our events, we had this code of conduct, which is available in many other languages, depending on where it was, because it's the global game jam next. Um, and um, we had sponsors, including Eli Media, who also hosted a jam event, and uh, the ESA and Yo-Yo Games. So some of the tool sets, of course, were like Game Maker Studio and Game Star Mechanic, uh, amongst many others, of course. We also had Layla Shabir who was the keynote. She's from uh, Girls Make Games. Uh, she gave a lot of advice to students about plowing through and moving forward and um, advising. Um, <laughs> fun with GIFs. <laughs> um, we had a theme. The theme was fractals, which I know best from Star Trek. <laughs> Just nerding out on Star Trek here. It's the right place. And uh, so we had a curriculum about fractals and building games around that. Uh, this is actually an incomplete map. Um, we had, though, four sites in America, but we had 55 overall, and we reached over 2,000 children. And um, it was really exciting once this was in the wild, and we had um, you know, actual people reporting back. We had a Slack channel with photos, mostly for my presentation here, otherwise there's nothing. <laughs> uh, you could see there are all sorts of things in our busy July calendar. Um, and it started off in Sacramento, fueled by Doritos and pizza, <laughs> like any good game jam. So these are young game developers thinking about fractals and pizza. Um, and yes, yeah, so we did encourage a lot of sharing on social media. Of course, it's global, so here's one in Helsinki. Uh, we have a lot of planning and teamwork and collaboration, you can see. So it's not just you know, staring at a screen and creating code, but um, you know, a whole project and a whole day. Some of these sites were related to Global Game Jam, the uh, grown-up version, I guess, um, hosting sites there. This is from Indonesia. Uh, we have kids here getting together. This was actually one of the larger game jams. 
Um, and uh, it was just really exciting to see kids also mash up games that they know. So here are some girls making a, uh, well, as you can see, I don't know how that turns out. Five nights of, <laughs> I don't want to know how that turns out. <laughs> Coming to an app store near you. So here's another one. Uh, we've got some fractals from um, South America. And uh, we've got planning, and we've got kids getting together. And you know, these are often on weekends. You know, this is all out of school, informal time in July. And uh, this is in uh, Mexico. Uh, we also had, uh, this is from Bloxels. A lot of the uh, character design was going on here. And these students had printouts from uh, awards because you know, they had a certificate of accomplishment from taking part in this. And we also had Let's Play videos. So we had students uh, post some of their videos about how they created and what the day was like uh, and sharing out. And uh, this is the team. Uh, so I knew I wouldn't be able to memorize everything. So I made a GIF of the credits. So <laughs> I should say that this will be happening again next year. So look out for lots of emails and tweets. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. There are lots of ways to exchange value. And one of those ways of exchanging value is just this, talking to each other. So when I say hi, everyone, this next time, would you just do me a favor and say hi, David? Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Oh, that felt so good. I feel here. Now, I'm talking about the blockchain. The blockchain, uh, clap your hands if you've heard of the blockchain. Do you know what it is? It's the way to increase your value. Right now as we speak, you're increasing your value because when you leave here and tell people, I was at MIT and I talked about the blockchain and education, people are gonna go, ooh. <laughs> that means exactly nothing except they think that they want you on their team. Now my daughter, Tara, will tell you that part of what makes us human is that we exchange value through symbols. And when I say the blockchain as a symbol, we're exchanging meaning and that enables us to exceed the Dunbar number and do what we do best as humans, to organize past languages and geographical barriers. However, when we talk about abstract symbology, things get complicated. Go from arithmetic to algebra, even talk to a young child about the concept of zero and you'll quickly find where our cognitive abilities end. Now those limitations, intuitively are there, but when it comes to currency, which is what the blockchain is most known for, this is what's also enabled us to go from trading cows to trading cowrie shells and enabling us to accept currency that's a little bit more complicated, like the dollar bill, or religious symbology, or national symbology, or even sports teams. All of these are abstract concepts that don't physically exist in the world, and yet they're used to create meaning and group people together and form economies but they rely on trust. And that's the X factor, because for human beings, it's not just enough to have a tool. If I can have a sharp piece of metal, well, in a surgeon's hand, that can save a life, and in a criminal's hand, it can take one. So the question becomes, how do we create relationships and connections around trust? Well, I've been doing this work for a long time, and if you can see in this right image, my daughter's lurking in that slide underneath in this media conversation, and young people don't learn through just the adaptations of tools. They learn through modeling of behavior and values, and that's where the context has changed our game. Because now, the question becomes, what can we really rely on in the world? Even the question of where we get our information and what the information is worth is suspect. So let's go to the physical sciences. You want to disprove gravity? You get one chance. <laughs> Not everything is controversial we can rely on some sense of truth. So whether it's a thermodynamic system that opens to its environment and exchanges values to conform or to adapt, or whether it's economies of scale, when I started developing the concept of open source learning 10 years ago and implementing things in the classroom that were then considered dangerous because why on God's green earth would you let children onto the internet, now we have a different conversation. And I'll come back to the blockchain, but the blockchain is built up of smart contracts and distributed ledgers that contain artifacts. By sharing our learning artifacts outside the classroom and in the world, we create opportunities for people to participate in the conversation. And we create opportunities for learners to do what they love. This kid thought high school sucked and wanted to learn how to fly an airplane in my English class. All right, great, because if I open the system, 
Now I can connect him with a mentor who was a pilot at an airport, and three months later, I could find myself in the backseat of a tri Piper TriPacer aircraft 3,000 feet above the ground. Some people might question whether this was a good idea. <laughs> but for Matt, this was a brilliant idea because it connected him to something of purpose. It gave him the value. It gave him the motivation. It created interdependence between us because I had to trust him. And it also instilled a sense of hope. When the Wright brothers did their thing, if they didn't have that sense of hope, it's sort of a really complicated techno-suicide proposition. So out of all of this, we create these wonderful artifacts, but at the end we have a bottleneck. This was a page from my UCLA transcript. When, on, the, when in the world would you hire someone based on one number, and yet we still do these things? Some of you may say, but in the private sector, oh, we've got ways of getting around that. I, I've worked in HR for 20 years. How's that working out? <laughs> so. The blockchain seems to give us an opportunity to track in real time what portions of a course or what portions of a skill a student is mastering and according to whom. What's the mentorship model? What's the relationship? What's the authentic artifact that I can see? Now, one of the keys to this is not building for, it's building with. So I've partnered up with teacher for one class in the fall and I'm gonna ask my students what's next and we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kira Baker Doyle, and I'm here to talk to you about the Connected Learning and Teacher Education Network, also known as CLNTE, uh, a collective effort that I've been a part of to help spark a bit of a revolution in teacher education. So, on July 8th, 2017, 23 educators, education scholars from around the country, came together in a small hot room with no air conditioner and no windows. They weren't even being paid to be there, and they stayed in college dormitories over the weekend. Hmm. Yeah, so if you know any professors, you know trying to organize an unpaid gathering over the, uh, s over the summer is uh, like herding cats. Um, so the question is, why were these, uh, educa these education scholars there? They were there to revolutionize teacher education. It was in that room that CLNTE was born, a network that's dedicated to researching, teaching, and learning, and developing connected learning in teacher education. So if you know me, you know that I'm a social network scholar. Here's my shameless plug. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about six different strategies that CLNTE used um, to develop that network from the perspective of a network theorist. So the first, wow, this is really off. <laughs> um, so the first is intentional network design. Um, so we know from network theory that strong ties and common work help to develop trust and exchange of tacit knowledge. Um, and so we have face-to-face -face gatherings to support that kind of relationship development. We also know that diverse and weaker ties support innovation and leadership. So we have opportunities, um, openly networked opportunities to build those kinds of relationships. The second strategy <laughs> is uh, multimodal visioning work. So when we talk about our vision for what we want to do, we don't just talk, we draw it, we do videos, we do slideshows, we use poetry, and that helps us to connect to all different kinds of thinkers and, and learners. Um, our third strategy is studio and gallery spaces, use of those kinds of spaces. A studio space is a private space uh, where the group can kind of plan together and develop their voice and vision. So you see we use Slack, uh, we use email listservs and those kind of private spaces. But a gallery space is a space in which you, it's open to the public and you are engaging with the public. So for example, last winter we had a um, virtual writing retreat where we, uh, use we use blogs, we use um, Twitter, and, and those kinds of things to write together. The fourth strategy is our make and do attitude. We like to make together when we work. And one thing that we're really excited about making um, upcoming soon is a marginal syllabus on pedagogies of connected learning. Where's Remy? 
Uh, he's excited, see? <laughs> um, so we also uh, have this another strategy is our hybrid organizational structure. And uh, we are both kind of a network and an organization. You know, networks are really flexible but, and responsive, but they're really hard to sustain and have a common vision. So from an organizational perspective, we have this backbone of working groups that are led by members of the group on specific projects. Here we are doing some celebration of the fruits of our labor. Um, but from a network perspective, uh, we are very needs-based in our work. So when I say needs-based, uh, we're probably better than this guy. Um, we are responsive to the, uh, the interests and the, um, the ideas that folks have and, and to kind of help them out. So that makes us a little bit more ne network-like. Right? And finally, uh, we hold equity at the center because an ethical purpose helps us to take risks and keep going when things get tough. Um, and I should also say there are four CLNT members that are doing a special issue on equity um, in the IGLT this fall. So here's those six different strategies. And if you look closely, you'll notice that they really do tie in and connect with the connected learning principles. And that's not by accident. That's because a lot of us have been influenced by those principles in our own work. I will also be honest, there, it's not always perfect. Sometimes we have great ideas that don't always get off the ground, <coughs> podcast. Um, but uh, you know, you gotta keep trying and you have to trust the process to grow, right? And so, so, so thus far, we have kindled this kind of spark of energy and interest in transforming teacher education to value connected learning, social justice, and equity, and it's something that we're really excited about. Um, and so before I go, I want to do some shout outs. So if you have been involved in CLNTE in any way, peripherally as a leader, could you just stand up real quick and wave your hand so folks can see? If, where's a couple folks? There you go. So there you go. Those are the folks that are helping to keep this going. And in the true connected learning style, we will be having a networking session um, this Friday for breakfast. So if you're interested in learning more, joining in and having fun with us, please come join us. And that's it. Thank you. Good evening. How's everybody doing? You sticking with us? Oh, my name is Barbara Chamberlain. I'm a game developer, app developer, professor, researcher at New Mexico State University. And I want to talk about some things I've learned from developers at 12 Game Studios. Um, specifically how it relates to our industry. At the Learning Games Lab, we're a nonprofit development shop located at a university, and we work for a variety of different clients. Jesse Shell and I are working uh, together on a book. It turns out that both of us individually at two studios really developed a very similar process for creating educational tools. We're calling it the Transformational Game Network, the Transformational Learning Design Model, and it's worked perfectly for us as we're trying to articulate those steps. But what we wanted to find out, was it just us, or does everybody use a model like this? So I took six months on sabbatical, and I went and did site visits at six different studios. And then I followed up with formal interviews with six developers and additional studios. And uh, three of those were professional field trips, where I took people from my studio with me, and we had time to spend at the studio just learning. And here's about 275 seconds of my expertise on the topic. So we went to a range of studios, for-profit, non-profit, everybody did education educational or transformational. We even did one person consultants. So I really saw a range of what one person to 150 person studio has in common and how they are different. One, our field is immature. Educational games have been around for a long time. I've been working in it almost 30 years, but we're still immature in studio management and terminology and what, how we interpret agile. We all use these terms with 100% confidence, but we all use them to mean different things. Two, we're afraid to share what we know. Everybody said to me, are you gonna give my secret away? And I said, no, no, just to the 600 closest friends at Connected Learning Summit, they, but nobody else. Because I'm going to tell you their secret, but every studio I saw a lot of processes, uh, how they did HR, how they did business, how they did retention, how they did marketing, and there was a lot of diversity in all of those processes that I saw in all of the studios, with the exception of design. Because by and large, the people who are good at designing things, you want to know their secret? 
just do whatever you're already doing. I mean, probably it's going to be exactly like them because we all use a very, very similar process from getting to the change we want to make to the game we want to build off of that. It might vary on the time we give it or the people involved or how long it takes, but by and large, it's the same process which is awesome because that means it can be taught, it can be learned, it can be refined, it can be shared. And that's what's gonna move our industry forward. So we're gonna give a talk tomorrow, Jesse and I, on our, on our process. Other people here are sharing their processes. The other thing that's interesting is that secret process that's not so secret, it's not what made the studios amazing. And these studios are amazing. I only picked the best ones to go to and they did great, great work. Now let's just be honest, mistakes were made. We have all had a project we are a little embarrassed about, that we could have done better, that the client was crazy, that we ran on money. That's when we learn the most. We shouldn't be embarrassed about that because we are not each other's enemy. We in game studios are competitive. We look at other people's projects and we say, oh, I wish I could have made that. But we don't compete with each other. Our enemy is the idea that educational games shouldn't be made. That's our enemy. And the solution is for us as a group to mature our field, thank you, and mature our field and to help move it forward for all of us. That's the goal. And we do that by sharing information each other about what makes us good. So what then makes a studio valuable, effective, and successful? I will tell you. Do you want to know? Yes. It's one thing. So in the movie City Slickers, remember the city guy went to Curly, the seasoned cowboy, and said, what is the secret of life? And the cowboy said, one thing. And the city slicker said, what's the one thing? And the cowboy said, you got to figure that out for yourself. <laughs> and for all of these studios that I went to, they all had at least one thing that was unique and amazing. Maybe it was their HR. Maybe it was retaining people. Maybe it was a data back end. Maybe it was a longstanding relationship with a client that, that helped give fluidity to their, whatever. Everybody had this one thing that was amazing. And it doesn't take anything away from my studio to learn about the one thing other studios do well. So that's my challenge. Today, while you're here, immediately after, go learn another studio's one thing. Buy somebody a drink. Whatever drink it is, it can be me, it can be somebody else, but find a friend. The reason I got these 275 seconds of knowledge is because I met people at studios who were gracious and kind and said, yeah, come and I'll talk to you and I'll share with you what I know. And we all need to do that because when we all do that and share our information with each other, that's how we get better. We share a lot of the same information and the things that make us unique and special are going to make our whole industry better because a rising tide lifts all boats. Peace. Hey everybody, my name is Jeremy Dittmeyer. I'm here from the University of Iowa and today I'm going to talk to you all about queering up games. Why I think that's important, what I did about it. Now, up there, that's my super creative Twitter handle. It is my name with a period in the middle. Feel free to tweet at me about this. Now, if you weren't sure, video games have a diversity and representation issue. <laughs> this is the State of the Union address this last year. You'll see there's a few women, there's a few people of color. Thanks to Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin, my home state, there is one queer person in that audience. But otherwise, there's a whole lot of white men. Now, before you start tweeting at me right now about this new game that's coming out, I presented and wrote up this talk before Sony announced that The Last of Us 2 was going to have a queer main character. So this is not my fault. I am very excited about this. I'm so excited to see how they're going to treat the, her sexuality. But instead, most of our games are still starring hyper-masculine, straight white men. And if I have to play another game like this, I'm probably going to stop playing games. So what are we gonna do about it? We're going to queer up games. Now, how are we gonna do that? That I'll get to in a second. But this is nothing new. This isn't me coming up with some great idea. The queer indie game scene has existed for a long time. You could pull out your laptops right now and you could pull up dysphoria and you could see what it's like to go through hormone replacement therapy. You could pull up limb and see what it's like when you have to hide your true self. Because if you're out in public and you're not hiding it, you might be harassed, bullied, or harmed. These games take the queer experience and what it's like to be queer in this world and put it at the center of the game. What's it like to learn who you are? What it's like to come out? What it's like to have that first true love? And then everybody else gets to experience that as well. 
Now, you could say, but you could do this for years in games like The Sims or Fable or Mass Effect. And that's true, there are some queer themes. But I don't know about you, but no matter how many times I high-five somebody, they're not going to sleep with me like they do in The Sims. So, <laughs> what these games do is they take sexuality and they put it at the edge. I borrowed that from Adrian Shaw. Games like Mass Effect, you can completely ignore the queer storylines if you want to. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those queer themes and put them back in the middle. And how are we doing that? We did it in Iowa through a queer game jam. Now, a queer game jam is, you know, it's kind of like any other underrepresented group. I'm gonna talk about some of the key things that I learned while putting this together. And if you don't wanna do a queer game jam, but you wanna do a people of color game jam, just replace the word queer with people of color and boom, you've got this. <laughs> so I'm gonna share the three things that I think are the most important things I learned because I only have five minutes to talk about it. And by that I mean one minute and 15 seconds. <laughs> so you need to find your queer game experts, you need to find your game design experts, and you need to find participants. Number three is really the most important because a game jam with five people just isn't fun. <laughs> so for your queer game experts, one of the things you could do is be an academic and go out and read about it, but that's not the best way to do it. Instead, go to Queerly Represent Me, play some queer games. Go on to Twitch, find queer content creators. They will gladly talk to you in their chat about what it's like to be queer on Twitch and play queer games. Then, you need to find a game developer. That was not me. It didn't matter how long I spent developing in Twine or doing game design um, workshops, I just wasn't going to be that expert. So instead, I went out and I found some undergrads who make games all the time. And I brought them in. They were so excited to work with us. They taught people at the Game Design Jam how to use Unity, something that I've seen before but couldn't really do myself. So go out and make those partnerships. I don't remember putting this slide up here, so I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> so then, up in that corner, you see that person up there? That's Waldo. Don't imagine that there is a deficit when you're going into this. Queer people want to make games. 20% of the game design industry identified as queer this last year. That's over-representation. So don't go out there thinking, oh, I'm gonna go get queer people excited about games. They're already excited. What you're going to do is provide a space for them to make games in. Now it might take some convincing. You might need to go out and find these groups. I went out and I started by emailing campus groups. Undergrads do not respond to email. Go to their meetings, find the leadership, talk to them and convince them that they want to come out and join your group. To help, help, help them to see what's important about a queer game jam in getting their message across. Then make a poster. This is the one I used. Put it everywhere that you can find that they'll let you. Businesses, buses, bulletins, boards, wherever you can find it, get the people to come out. Now, <laughs> so if you guys want to learn more about this, this is my email address. This is a great queer game that you can all go out and play right now. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to making more queer games. I'm going to start talking right now because I need to make sure the lav mic is working. It's great to see everybody here. I'm from the Concord Consortium. If you don't know us, you know the what we brought to the world. We brought you probeware. We brought you online PD. We brought you the first virtual high school. Today I'm here to talk about something different. It won't surprise you when I say that data are everywhere. Five years ago, there were already more bits of data in the digital universe than there are stars in the physical universe. By 2020, it would be 10 times that. Data, science, as a, as a career, demand and pay are soaring. But there's a problem. You see, today's fourth grader is tomorrow's data scientist. What are we doing for her? That's what I'm here to talk about because the answer is not enough. Now you say, wait a minute, I just saw this great data literacy program and then I remind you about Great Aunt Flo. Yeah, I know you've got one. For me, it's Dawn. Now she's doing great. With your help, she's got her AOL mail account up and humming. <laughs> she just got a smartphone. She is proudly computer literate. But that's the issue. You see, to the literate, computing is a task. Reports to be written, recipes found, messages sent. But to the fluent, are you one? Computing is a tool. They compose via pixel brush and shader, author in 3D space, weave with APIs and analytics. For them, bytes and pixels are a medium. 
Literacy, you see, gets jobs done, but fluency opens doors. To the fluent, everything's possible. Symphonies of graphic design, singing sonnets in Blueprint and CAD, social media tapestries. So back to data. And back to her, what are we doing to help her thrive? What are we doing to make her see graphs as tools, not tasks? How are we helping her see data as a medium? How are we making her data fluent? That, my friends, is where we enter the realm of data science education, the way we're preparing her and everyone to be a data fluent worker, citizen, and voter. So I'd like to talk about the K-12 data experience. I have a slide for that. Oh, wait. That's my slide. We've got another saying, data are everywhere except in the classroom. That's the problem. There is no zilch, zero, nada. We need to fill that gap with three things, data tools, data experiences, data moves, and data experiences. These are the core elements of data science education. I'm going to touch on all three. I want to start with data tools. A data tool is something designed for learning with and about data. What's an example? Well, this may be my most important slide behind the blank one because Excel is not a data tool. So, what does one look like, you ask? Okay, you ready? I'm going to show you one we call CODAP. Imagine two sharks in the Pacific Ocean tagged and swimming around. Okay, we're going to click on the table. There's one, all right, and there's another. All right, let's make a graph. Hmm, let's look at their speeds. Hmm, okay. Looks like they're moving at a bunch of different speeds. That's interesting. Let's sort by month. Um, wow. In August, they're moving around pretty quickly, but in January, February, kind of slowly. Let's color by depth and see what's going on. Looks like they're diving, moving up and down a lot in January. Where are they doing that? Oh, over there. Let's highlight on the graph. They're only there in the spring. In 30 seconds with the data tool, we have discovered the White Shark Cafe. It took scientists 20 years to uncover it. Why do sharks go there? We don't know. It's fascinating. Look it up. How did we find this? We didn't find it by staring at the data. We did not find it by making a pretty picture. We find it, found it by getting arms deep, by diving in and pulling out the data stories with data moves. These are the fundamental elements of data interaction, the music notes of working with data. Students need these, and they need them everywhere in the curriculum. In science class, yes, but also in history, in literature, all over. They need to see graphs as ways of understanding and bringing insight to the world and see data as the stuff of asking and answering questions. This won't come easy. We're pushing back against hundreds of years of unsatisfying tools and brain-dead graphing tasks, so we're forging a coalition, signing up people around the globe, superintendents and schools, industry moguls and research mavens, publishers, policymakers, your organization, after-school data clubs. You see, we're throwing a revolution because that's what it will take. So we're calling you to arms with us. What are you waiting for? Suit up, join in, come make a data mess. Because that fourth grader, what she needs is the experience and the confidence to view data as her natural environment, to walk up to the edge of the pool and dive in. You know how smoothly she shows Aunt Flo how to work the iPad? Imagine that, but with data. That's the world we envision. That's the universe we need, but we cannot do it alone. We need all of you. We need all of us. So right now, take out your smartphones. Right now, go to messydata.org, sign up, and join us in the data science education revolution. <laughs>
Um, and so you can make a LARP about literature, about science, about history, literally anything. So, and there's a variety of ways they can look. Do you want to make a Jane Austen novel and have people get interact with it? Do you want to teach, put, create uh, the crew of a, of a space station and have them learn about leadership and politics? Do you want to do a cyberpunk narrative and have people talk about transhumanist philosophy? You can do all of these things. And the great thing about it is that because you are actually playing your character physically, whatever your character knows how to do, you have to learn how to do it. If your character has to run for your life, so do you. And so people will go to great lengths to look badass and competent. I have seen people learn martial arts, learn to run, learn to play an instrument, study history, uh, learn to code or, do, or, or do, take on maker skills, all so that they could create worlds and characters that they were excited about. So don't underestimate. And when, the great thing about occupying these characters is that it gives you a sense of agency you might not feel comfortable with elsewhere. So people can take on leadership roles. They can take on complex political negotiations. They can engage with systems that are intimidating, all because of the layer of fantasy that LARPing creates. Okay, Caitlin, you say, you have convinced me I want to make my first LARP. Where do I start? Don't be scared, you've done this before. Think back on Model UN, Mock Trial, Murder Mystery Dinners, anything like that that, has, that is similar, and think about the aspects of the role playing and rules that appealed to you. Next, you should probably go out and play an actual LARP. You wouldn't write a book if you hadn't uh, you know, read one. Um, I recommend Intercon, which is a uh, LARP convention here in New England in February. It's like LARP tapas, you can try a whole bunch in one weekend. Um, <laughs> You can try different narratives and different different rule systems and see what works for you. But if you can't do that, you can just start Googling it. Um, this, I, this is, I, this is a, I wouldn't make this my first choice because trying to find a LARP is a little like trying to score drugs. Um, no one admits to doing it. More people admi are doing it than you think and you may end up on a weird subreddit. Um, but that being said, you can do it. All right, so the next thing that you need to be aware of, and my gif is not gifing, um, is that um, LARP is super emotionally engaging, um, which is great until it get, you get to bleed when the things your character is feeling is what the players are feeling. So make sure to look out for the emotional safety of your players. Steer clear of heavy topics for your first few games. Um, when you're working with kids, and I imagine a lot of you would be, please give them agency. Kids don't have agency, so please give them agency in games. Make sure they can walk away from situations they don't like. Make sure that they have the power to be the protagonists in their own story. And if you have 25 players, you have 25 protagonists. Good luck. <laughs> All right, so now you need goals. If you're a PE teacher, maybe you want your students to be able to run three miles. So the character goal might be escape this zombie. So that's a starting point. But it's much more effective if you, if you integrate these goals into a meaningful narrative. And this gif is not gifing, but please imagine a dog chasing a chicken. Um, <laughs> um, so... You know, Run, running from a zombie, good. Running from a zombie because you have to save your little brother who is the only person in the world who knows the cure to the zombie plague, way better. Okay, uh, now it's time to implement some rules. Think back on the LARPs that you did, early, that, that you did earlier at that convention or elsewhere um, and fi find the system that works for you that resolves conflicts that people aren't always yelling about who may, may or may not have won a conflict. All right, what else? This seems to be, okay. And for God's sake, play test. Play test your rules, preferably with the age group that you're designing for, or everything will be on fire and you will be in the darkest timeline. I guarantee it. I've seen it happen so very many times. So definitely play test. And once you've done that, it's time to start writing the story. Integrate your characters into everything. There should be more connection. That, was, that went by really fast. Okay, thank you. Uh, your character should be integrated into everything in the setting and connected to other characters like a giant crazy conspiracy corkboard. Um, remember, they are all protagonists and they all need things to do and ways to affect the story. So ultimately, what I, so in conclusion, this slide is really sticking around, isn't it? In con so, um, and I really have been to LARP staff writing meetings that look like this. Okay, so in, in, in conclusion, LARPing is punk rock as hell. Learn three chords and just do it. It's how I got started as a game designer and as a teenager, now I design games at MIT. And I would know if that LARPing is punk rock as hell because I once actually learned to play electric ukulele so that I could be a punk musician in a LARP that is a real instrument and I'm really, really playing it. That is not, however, my real hair. Thank you very much. I'm Maya Jujeva, the Director of Digital Learning at the New School, and I also lead in Immersive Learning at the Axe Reality Center. I'm also the co-founder of Digital Bodies, a consulting group with focus on AR, VR, MR, and their impact on society and education. 
Stories help us make sense of the world and have been around since the dawn of humanity. But we are at the beginning of something new, something that will change the way we tell and create stories forever. So let's take a moment and see how we got here. Storytelling is how we pass on values and experiences from one generation to the next. Over the millennia, storytellers has evolved from oral traditions shared around the campfire to viral videos shared with millions around the globe. Theater has always been an arena for experiences. When Victorian technophiles played with mirrors and light and created their illusions, they were already playing with mixed reality that wouldn't appear for another century and a half. Soon after, cinema developed moving images, compelling illusions that speak to us from the screen. Like the Lumia brothers and George Millet, today we find ourselves witnessing the birth of a new medium, seeking a new language for a new reality. Traditional storytelling has a beginning, middle, and end, but immersive stories shift from time-based narration to spatial narration, from storytelling to story living and world building. This is a radical shift, taking us from the passive recipient to the protagonist. It is not about the tools or the headset, it's about the profound change in our experiences, which will be shared, empowering, and at times even frightening. Immersive environments activate our brains in ways that are strikingly similar to real world experiences. The most powerful feeling in immersive stories is the sense of presence. We can now inhabit and have agencies in the stories we encounter. Immersive projects use storytelling to evoke empathy, promote awareness, and spur action. In the immersive multi-narrative experience, Carne Arena, the director in Yeritu breaks the dictatorship of the frame. You explore the sensory experience of refugee lives, step into their skin, and literally see the beating pulse in their hearts. In the future, we'll have stories that blur the lines of the physical and digital world. We'll, we'll follow characters that will, in turn will follow us in our daily lives. We'll sit next to them on the couch and talk with them at night. With AI-driven characters, stories will become continuous branching narratives. In the past, characters were developed by the author. In an AI world, characters is shaped by every move, gaze, and expression. In the future, called with drive story. The, cogn the, the conversion of the Internet of Things, immersive media, and the advances in network speed will envelop us in a continuous stream of information, a future of ambient communications that's embedded, anticipatory, and multisensory. Here are the three provocations of stories from the future, three speculations on how immersive platforms will transform our experiences. One is a dystopian vision, one of a fantasy world, and one of narrative that merge with reality. Uh, there is the future portrayed in the movie Ready Player One, a dystopian world created for our dreams, a future where the technology exists and we have built virtual worlds, and yet they're not contributing to improving our lives or society. There's the future portrayed in the Westworld series, our desire to immerse ourselves in a world without consequence, a human-conceived AI playground where stories are built and layered of, in layers of code designed to create unique storylines. Finally, what is our future when we live in characters in mixed reality? When virtual stories become our lived experience, transcending our personal, social, and professional boundaries? Are we ready to navigate the ethical and, so and social questions that come with them? I'm troubled that those of us working in the field agree more often than disagree about the future of immersive stories. What if there's a black swan ahead of us, an event that is deemed improbable, that creates massive and unforeseen consequences, and yet we, especially the experts, remain blind to it? We are stepping into a new world that will create and change the very fabric of reality. The future of immersive stories belongs to the next generation of creators who think spatially, with no preconceived notions of other mediums. Our students will come up with stories that truly can only be made in XR. We continue our journey from Africa through Greek theater, Renaissance art, to movies, AI, and now a new medium is on the doorstep. It is not that the old mediums will cease to exist, but that they will be captivated by the power of a new one. In immersive stories, we are all explorers, um, actors and architects on the edge of a new reality. What stories are you going to make? What stories are you going to live? Hello. Can you hear me all right? 
Great. Uh, my name is Erhard Graf. It's good to be on this stage. I just finished my PhD from the MIT Media Lab. Thank you. I'll be starting as, a, as an assistant professor um, at Olin College of Engineering, which is in that tiny type, thanks to uh, PowerPoint conversion. And uh, I'm talking about the rise of monitorial citizenship, a type of civic engagement which is important to us who are thinking about designing technology, um, but also those who are thinking about educating the next generation of citizens. Who remembers the story of Martha Payne from a few years ago in the UK? She's a nine-year-old in Scotland who started blogging her lunches, um, and she got a viral meme going, uh, uh, everybody talking about about this to the point where her, her local council was fighting her to stop doing it. Um, but the public rose up and said, this is important. We want to be aware of these questions about nutritious lunches. We had celebrity endorsements from Jamie Oliver. She raised a lot of money for this issue to talk about kids' lunches around the world. And I say this is a form of monitorial citizenship, uh, civic engagement in which people collect information about their surroundings or track issues of local or personal interest in order to improve their communities and pursue justice. That's from my dissertation, also coming out in the International Encyclopedia of Media Literacy. Um, this is against a backdrop of high levels of mistrust in government in Washington. We're uh, not doing so well in that. This is also an international phenomenon where we have low trust in institutions um, in modern democracies um, like the United States. Uh, in contrast with places like China and the UAE, which are seeing high levels of trust in their governments because they're getting things done just without the participatory democracy part. The folks that are following these trends and really scared are most worried about stuff like this, which is young people saying that they think it is less essential to live in a democracy. And so monitorial citizenship is reacting to this in ways thinking about how citizens can have some power and some accountability um, to change their world. Um, this started with an idea of monitorial citizens in a book called The Good Citizen by Michael Schutzen. He was trying to think, how do we distribute the responsibility of folks to kind of read everything, um, to be experts in everything? Maybe um, citizens can scan the world and respond to things that, um, that, uh, that they feel a particular connection with. Zizi Papacharisi and Ethan Zuckerman, two communication scholars, said, actually, digital technology, things like smartphones that allow us to uh, collect data really easily, the internet that allows us to connect together, suggest that monitorial citizenship is kind of a new wave here that is supercharged by the technology, allowing us to collect information, share stories and insights, either ourselves or through the media, coordinate with networks of other civic actors, and then pursue accountability for institutions and elite individuals and their perceived responsibilities. I want to go through some examples of how technology is kind of supporting monitorial citizenship. Public Lab, which was started here at the Media Lab, with cheap forms of aerial mapping using simple digital cameras, balloons and kites, empowering activists to kind of create these tools for environmental um, uh, um, uh, monitoring. Promise Tracker also started here at the Media Lab, working with actually a, the state of Pará in Brazil and their school students who are monitoring the quality of lunches, which is a constitutional right that they have. Um, so they're trying to um, uh, so, uh, show that that is important to them. You have apps like See, Click, Fix, and Deer that allow people to easily re um, report issues to their local cities, like potholes and stuff, and get them fixed. They're setting the priority and what's important to them for the city to address. Platforms like Hollaback, um, which is collecting stories about street harassment, often from women. Um, street harassment is not documented and collected by police departments in most cases. So this draws public awareness to this as an ongoing issue and also creates a support community online for those that, have, uh, that are survivors of this problem. We Cop Watch and Black Lives Matter are actually giving us this kind of um, ability to, to understand the, the problem of police violence of people of color by recording those issues and then connecting them together as a trend under a narrative like Black Lives Matter that gives us a sense of a systemic problem. What does this rise of monitorial citizenship for me, mean for us as educators? Well, it's a digital and civic literacy issue because there are skills and knowledge necessary to do this well. And if we think about this next generation and monitorial citizenship as being one of the ways that they're participating, how are folks having different opportunities to participate, to practice this thing, have different resources, need to think about how this is unequally being prepared, uh, people are being prepared for this form of civic engagement. So we should be teaching information gathering and analysis. We should be teaching persuasive storytelling, teaching community organizing online and offline, and teaching democracy from the perspective of citizen power, not just institutional power like how a bill becomes a law and branches of government. Tools and models we can use are the public lab in their form of workshops working with communities and youth. Data Basic, which is a set of tools online for data analysis and data storytelling, and the Public Science Project, which supports youth participatory action research in New York. So we need to be thinking about how do we do this well, 
need to be thinking about monitorial citizenship as an issue that we need to be caring about. Um, and if you want to talk to me about that later, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks. So this is finally happening. Woo. Hi, uh, my name is Yu Jung Han. I am the fourth year PhD student from Warner School of Education, uh, University of Rochester. And uh, today I'll be talking about affinity pies in the game Overwatch, uh, collaborative knowledge building in beyond game culture. I guess it doesn't really make sense to you guys, but don't worry because we have 90 more slides to go. <laughs> So I have been teaching English language in my native country of Korea, then Japan, and then America. And while doing so, I have been using popular online games among my students as language teaching content for interest-driven learning. And I have noted this one phenomenon that I titled Affinity Pies, and it is my aim for today to tell you what this is. So Affinity Pies is an amalgamation of Affinity Space by James G. It's a space you go to for your nerdiness. And Pies, it's a four principles of cooperative activities by Kagan and Kagan, and I will talk a little bit more about this later. The problem is there are just so many online Affinity Spaces for games, and it just gives me a headache to think about where to start. And as we all know, who has time? I only have five minutes, maybe less than that. So I will focus on one specific game called Overwatch. Does any of you know what Overwatch is? Ooh, a lot of you. Please share your battle tech so you can play Overwatch together when everything is done. <laughs> so this multiplayer first person shooting game developed by Blizzard is not just game. Beyond game, the company is trying to develop Overwatch universe by constantly adding characters, adding more background stories, his stories among the characters through official web comics or short animated movies. And this is a brilliant work that they did. They don't give a full story all at once. They hid the pieces of information here and there, so it's impossible for individual to find all the pieces of information and put them together to see a bigger picture. This naturally calls for collaboration, and I have been pretty impressed to see what kind of collaborations is going on in this online affinity space. Then again, there are just too many types of collaboration is going on, and I still do not have time, and my headache is getting worse. So I am narrowing down my focus again. I will focus on one specific recent incident, which is an introduction of a new character called Moira. So even before the introduction of the character, people have been collecting pieces of information about this character from illustration of official web comic or on uh, in-game interaction among the characters. So people were collecting pieces of information, putting them together to unveil what this mysterious character is about. And after the introduction of the character, they were also doing a very decent learning, like decent experiment hypothesis is Moira can, can Moira defeat another healer? What about Tanker, right? And then they share their experiment result on the online and people watch it and they do another experiment. So while I was watching this collaborative knowledge building, I was really curious. Okay, so this is how this knowledge building is happening in this affinity space. Then what an individual do in the middle of this participation. So I took a closer look. And I noticed what I am looking at, witnessing in this online space from individuals is very close to the concept that I am familiar with called cooperative activities. So this is where PI kicks in. Positive interdependence, individual accountability, simultaneous interaction, and you call participation. So these four principles, by fulfilling these four principles, this has been a driving force where people participate in, contribute to community, uh, collaborative knowledge building. I wish I had more time to present specific um, examples for each principles, but maybe next time when I have four more hours to present. So here comes the big question. What does it have to do with connected learning? If you think about what affinity pies are, it is actually connected learning itself, shared purpose. 
who is Moira. Interest-driven, open-end network, academically oriented, you will be surprised to see that, like, how decent their experiment is or the level of their fan literacy, fan fiction, fan arts. So maybe we have to give them an opportunity to see the value of what they are learning and gaining from these affinity pies. If you have more questions, please, please find me, come to me, talk to me. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, my name is uh, Mirek and I apologize totally for my German accent, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm talking about connected learning environments and waiting for the first slide. Oh, perfect. Um, it's a trip I started six years ago and uh, indeed I'm just talking about coding and making mit Minecraft. It's not MIT and UND, it's my German title of my worksheet for my students. <laughs> so. Um, my name on Twitter is Infshem, ask me later what it means. And this is the real learning environment where I teach every day my students. And it's boring because, could you tell me when this picture was taken before or after the students leave the room or enter them? Uh, you know nothing because they have no footprints inside. Just until 2012 when a student watched a Let's Play on YouTube uh, where some a uh, guy hunted a pig with a sword, and I thought, well, pigs in Doom? I couldn't remember that, because I didn't know the game. And we had a big and great, and great discussion about that, and I said, oh, let's make a test to I try to use Minecraft as a virtual environment, uh, learning environment, and I'm the teacher, I'm the one who is standing above you, and you are somewhere down, and I will try to find you and teach you the topics I have to teach. Um, I was totally lost, and this was <laughs> very shocking, because I saw 25 students in front of me with weird names above their heads. I don't translate anything. And some of them were armed and dangerous, and some were ironically smiling to me, and they are all waiting for me for learning. This was awesome. And I learned a lot of it because, and there's no typo, I'm also a learner since then. And I learned, for example, that you can modify the game with extensions to your special needs, and uh, we are not sleeping, we are talking and uh, using modifications. And I also try to put everything I learned in university about constructivism um, inside the learning environment. And I use, for example, the flat land to see at the end uh, the growth knowledge, like a crystal garden when they program virtual turtles. Uh, and I also use different ways um, to, to pick the students up where they are. For example, we call it in German Binnendifferenzierung. <laughs> I hope the terms are correctly translated. Uh, so it's just one world where we are also working together and we don't use three different tools. This is what I want to say. And I also like the idea of stealth learning, uh, where you put the topic you want to teach, like loops in programming, inside a creative assignment, like build a stairway, for example, and code your turtle to do that. I laminated a very simple worksheet and they get overhead markers and paint some visual commands on it and then they take the Lego turtle and talk about algorithm thinking and they don't need the terms before they do it, they just do it and they discuss and they create source code. And this was the first step where I said, oh, this is a connected learning environment because now you have some turtles creating in the flat world special houses or uh, just uh, make some kind of border patrol <laughs> when they're on the toilet, the students. <laughs> and then one student showed me the Arduino. I never knew it before. And I said, ooh, that's, that's awesome. I, I want to do it myself in my, um, um, with my courses. And uh, I, I just thought, what about the idea when you can modify the game to control the hardware? And the students make some great ideas and plans about the future of technology, about smart houses, intrusion detection. You see the do 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 I don't need to translate that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and... <clears throat> Also, with people with disabilities, and this is awesome, it's uh, 10 years old, he's thinking about safety, traps, and future, and he made a, um, a reminder tool, if it is night in the game, an LED shows you that you have to go to bed in real life, 10 years old, because his mother maybe has no chance to tell it. <laughs> so I bought a lot of stuff, I had never heard of it before, you see, Respice, Leonardo, Arduino, we, uh, we do little bits, and so on, I just ordered it, uh, no one asked me what's, what's this money for. Um, I'm in a public school, so it's a little bit difficult to get the finance. And then I created this block, and then you press the lever, and the, you cannot hear the children scream, but they're very loud. Oh, I love it, it's awesome, I want to do more. <laughs> and so they had many, very, very cool inventions. And so we started uh, great projects like, um, ah, this, okay. Uh, I, I, 
I um, discovered the four C's, um, like they had to work together to collaborate, communicate. This is a sheep, electro sheep. It's from a toilet paper roll, and <laughs> there's a bicycle bulb on it, and it can uh, be turned on. This is a door opener for wheelchair drivers, um, making it with uh, the mod. This is a Wi-Fi button where you can build a bridge if there's flood area. This is also very funny. The turtle says the birdies to turn. <laughs> And this is also from the 10th grade, it's awesome. You press the button, the minecart drives in the game and sends commands to my blocks, and the traffic lights will turn on and off in the right um, combination. And the timing is not done with my block, but with the length of the, the railroads. So this is my room now. Remember the beginning picture? It's more like a maker space. Next summer, we'll break down the wall between it, and we have a very large, very nice area. So you're always welcome to, to visit me and have fun. Thanks. Hello. Because you have to start somewhere. Hello. Don't leave. Where the hell are you going? You got 10 minutes. 10 <laughs> minutes. Me, Jeremy. <laughs> so I'm going to offer some provocations around um, maker education and design thinking. And these ideas were triggered um, by the final question at a really well-known maker conference last fall. The keynote had just given this really lovely talk connecting STEM and art. And the last question that we took up was, how do we get art teachers into making? I found it really a fascinating question. <laughs> like, isn't that what artists do all day? <laughs> Is make. That's what they're doing all day long. My spouse and my daughter both make a living doing art, graphic designer and an artist. My, my spousal unit makes me robots every year for our anniversary, and they will be featured in this talk. I, I work with making and tinkering in my classrooms all the time. I'm a huge advocate. But it does make me wonder when we ask, what does it mean to bring making to art teachers or to artists? And I'm wondering if we mean coding. And I'm wondering if, as my colleague asked, Leslie, who's a physicist at this conference, does the maker movement, are they starting to think of this narrow definition that what making is, is producing artifacts with novel technologies? Is that how we're defining making? Should we think about that? Like what counts as making? And who's making counts? And that's the more important question. Because I hear people say it's the new shop, but they don't say it's the new home ec. So who's making counts? In this moment in time, I think we need to consider kind of two interconnected ideas. One is broadening definitions of what counts as making and thinking about how making emerges from communities of practice that have making at their core. And if we mean bringing innovative, digital, industrial technologies to communities of practice that already have making, what's that do to their maker practice? And are we sure that's what we want to do? So I want to offer you a cautionary tale from my own field of literacy studies and composition. We've thought for years about what counts as writing, what counts as literacy, whose literacies count. There's this very commonplace belief that you can teach writing, first year comp, um, as a skill that students put in their pocket and then they take it out whenever they need to write. <laughs> and even if we had a conversation about basics, what counts as a basic, we'd actually have a large discussion about that and we'd come to talk about writing in the ways that our community uses inscriptions to make meaning. So that how a poet uses a text and how a scientist composes and how a geographer who tell me that really all they care about is a pretty map, not words, a pretty map, is very, very different. We have a very famous scholar in my field, David Russell, who says teaching writing, I'm going to put making in there too, is something like trying to teach people how to improve all their ball using skills. So you're gonna get better at jacks and ping pong and basketball by in one course. What kinds of games should one teach? And how can one teach ball using skills unless one also teaches students the games? Since the skills have their motive and meaning only in terms of a particular game or games that use them. So we have writing across the disciplines, right, that we think about so that if you want to really learn to write like a physicist, you kind of got to hang out with a physicist. And if you want to write like a poet, you got to be hanging out with other poets. There isn't really something basic. So if you're someone like me, you start thinking about what does this mean for making and maker culture? Um, is making is making is making? Will we define it so narrowly, produce novel technologies with innovative tools 
that will think that we can teach an intro course on design thinking, as I heard talked about at a lot of conferences I went to last year. And what education will do to that is quiz students on, put these in the order that they are intended to be. We do this with writing. We say to students, you know, you just brainstorm, and then you outline, and then you draft, and then you revise, and you edit. Ta-da! And we don't talk about anything that writing is really... Have you ever written a grant? It's just really not that goddamn tidy. <laughs> and so I, I want to make sure we hold on to, do we mean this, produce artifacts with novel technologies. I've been interviewing um, faculty and colleagues about the way they talk about make in their classes. So my poet coll colleague, Sarah Pape, said, my students make out of the meaning of their lives. They make material things, poems, out of the meaning of their lives. And my colleague, Leslie, who's a physicist, says, in our class, we're actually making content in physics. We're making models of the world. How are those connected or not? So what counts as making and who's making counts? Maybe what we should also keep in mind as we're doing this work, again, big fan, big fan, do it a lot, is that making is many things, and we might want to start with the way making emerges in particular communities of practice and ask them about their making before we bring it to them. All right, guys. Hello, hello. Last one. Lucky 13. Hey, Barry. How's it going? All right. <clears throat> What can go wrong, Lucky 13? So I'm going to talk to you today about augmented reality. We're going to talk about perception and ultimately how we're merging the physical and digital with the things we build and uh, some of the products we're creating. Oh, there we go. Uh, so first, this probably isn't a problem here, has been before. Augmented reality, the idea that we can superimpose images on the world, right? The yellow line on the football field, Jeremy and Snapchat, or in this case, a nifty heads-up display showing where we are in the presentation. So you'll know when, when you can leave. So AR has a, has a lot of use cases in education, of course. One of the first things that people would talk about when we first started showing this eight or ten years ago was we can engage multiple learners uh, with a single medium. But I think, and what I hope to show you right now, is that we can actually, and what I think is more important, is we can actually engage a single learner over multiple senses, which hopefully uh, you'll believe me here at the end. So five years ago, we did an augmented reality study at informal learning environments, zoos, museums, we chose a zoo in this case, and we wanted to see if we could change what people remembered when they left. Ultimately, that led to behavioral change, which is important to the zoos. Uh, you can read the research here in this journal at the bottom, uh, but ultimately what we did was we took people from a failing grade, an F, all the way to an A using AR and, and going through these exhibits. Uh, so this was uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Then just uh, a few days ago, a few, few weeks ago, recently, uh, NeuroInsights published some research around uh, some brain imaging where they saw that the, the part of the brain responsible for memory and coding just lights up, absolutely lights up when people are using AR versus non-AR uh, mediums. So further supports the theory. So switching gears a little bit, at Merge, you know, this is one of the sayings we have. If you look at really any society and, and, and uh, what really develops the people in it and the society as a greater whole, uh, we think toys play an important role in that. And so toys are one of the things that we're focusing on and the products we're building, and, it, and it's in that that uh, inspires the things we build. So enter the Merge Cube. This is a physical object that you hold in your hand. When you hold a device over it, it uh, comes to life. We say it's like holding holograms in the palm of your hand. Um, and ultimately it's a toy. It's built as a toy. There's a lot of games for it and fun stuff you can do. Uh, but like any good thing, education found out about it and they've been buying it out like crazy and uh, using it in the classroom. Ultimately they're using it though to visualize things that they're having a hard time explaining. The solar system, anatomy, cellular biology, all of these kinds of exciting things. Here's an example of how it works. On the left you can see uh, a photo. And on the right, you can see a digital overlay that I see when I'm wearing augmented reality glasses or holding a phone up. Uh, you can see it's augmenting not just uh, the cube in my hand, but also the physical space around me. And so the way it works, let's see if this video works. Oh, this is a super sped up video. It's cool. So uh, ultimately, what I can do is I can use this cube to place digital objects in my physical space and walk around them. They're all perfectly tracked, and, and I can build uh, really interesting experiences. I can tell stories. And kids are using these to do all kinds of exciting things. Switching gears one more time. Um, a lot of the, the, the research I'm about to show you was first presented at SIGGRAPH. Last year, I was the Emerging Technologies Chair for SIGGRAPH. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, SIGGRAPH.org. Uh, there's a lot of exciting tech just like this that inspires work like this. So this is called Magic Pot. This came out of the University of Tokyo. And I'm going to try to tell you how it works. And ultimately, what this, the, the concept here in general is that using one of your senses, I can fool the others. 
Um, so the way this works is I'm sitting at a desk and I reach my hands under a table and underneath that table there's a blue tarp and a green cylinder. There's also a stereoscopic camera mounted under the table so it looks like if I reach my hands under there I can touch that, that cylinder, touch the tarp, whatever. On top of the table I then see a 3D video uh, of, that, of, of what I see under there. So again, it's, it's trying to simulate this idea that I can uh, see my hands, reach my hands, they're all in stereo and 3D. It's using active shutter glasses, that kind of thing. So what I do is I reach my hands under the table, I feel the sides of the cylinder, I touch the sides of the cylinder, it feels like a cylinder, whatever. I then pull my hands out, I look away, uh, they swap it for a cone, I reach my hands back under there and I start touching the sides of the cone and my hands move like this and I, I see it's a cone, great. Then what they do is they take you away and they flip up the thing and there's actually still just a cylinder underneath the table. And so, oh my, animated dog isn't animating. And so ultimately what, what they've done is they've, they've post-warped the video so that when I'm moving my hands like this, I actually see myself moving my hands like this. And so my brain tells me that I'm actually touching a, a, a cone when it's actually a cylinder. So ultimately these are just using two of our, two of our senses, right? Our eyes and our hand and, our, and touch. Uh, we have many more. And so I think as we can incorporate more of these things, we're going to be able to create much more interesting and uh, immersive experiences. So ultimately, I think one of the questions people start asking is like, you know, what's real, what isn't? What's the difference between these physical objects or these digital representations of these objects? And, uh, you know, I really don't know if that's sort of the most important question. I think this slide is sticking. I think... Uh, Ultimately, I think what we want to inspire and what we hope to inspire is, is, is to have students not wonder what's real, but instead ask what's true. Thank you. Can you please join me in giving deep respect to every one of our speakers? I don't know if you've ever given one. I don't know if you've ever given one. Ignite talks are super hard, and every one of you killed it. Great job. Please come back on Friday at 2.30 for the second round of Ignite Talks. And in the meantime, please enjoy the tech demo and opening reception. Thank you. Thank you.